We're going to read from James this morning. Good book, book of James. Chapter 4. I think you're familiar with some of these verses. And uh, we'll get a little more familiar. Starting with verse 1 down through verse 4, especially verse 4. From whence come wars and fightings among you? So, uh, when does trouble come? Contentions stirred up uh, among people. Not everyone, but they come. Come they not hence even of your own lusts and desire that war in your members? So he's telling us the source of trouble right inside of us. Starts inside of our thinking. Ye desire and have not, verse 2. Ye kill or have the spirit of killing and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight, you fuss, you war. Yeah. Yet you have not because you don't ask. In other words, you, you get hyper over what you want, but you don't ask God to help you. You don't want Him in the picture. You want to do it yourself. And since you're so ambitious about it, you cause trouble with other people. Verse 3, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss. And what's that? That you may consume it upon your own desires your own lust. A lot of all this comes from selfish desires, which consumes a lot of human life and thinking. But we're going to zero in on verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses. Well, that doesn't sound very nice, does it? Talking about what can be possible among Christians. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God or hostility with God? Yeah. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now that doesn't sound very nice, does it? That's one thing about James. He says some mighty good things that feel comforting. But then he gets pretty forthright in some of his statements. <clears throat> Ouch. And they don't help us feel good. <laughs> of course, maybe sometimes we shouldn't feel good because we need to do some changing. Yeah, how about that? So here comes a red flag in the teaching of James, and it can be very helpful. And we might add to this a verse in Ephesians 6, verse 11, where it says, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand. You've heard that before. Able to stand against the wiles of for the craftiness of the devil. So, heads up, red flag. And I guess to have these kind of warnings once in a while doesn't hurt us. I don't mind reading them. Maybe over and over. Do you think our spiritual battle will ever end up? Stop? I don't think so. Never will. That's why we all know this answer. So let's glean just two thoughts out of this verse this morning. And the first one's this. My, oh my. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. And like we said before, enmity means hostility with God. Well, that doesn't sound very good. Not to me, anyway. But James starts this out 
when he says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, my. So here you have a physical thing that we know about in our life. These words to illustrate what we can do in our relationship with Jesus. Or maybe shouldn't do. Yeah. You know, Christians, when we come to Christ and are baptized and follow Him, we have taken Jesus as our bridegroom, our husband-to-be. That may not sound the nicest, but you know, the Bible talks about Christians being collectively the bride of Christ. Now that's a beautiful thought. So, if we have taken our vow and committed our life to Jesus and are married to Him, but if we become a friend of the world and hostile to God, we are now called adulterers and adulteresses. Which means, obviously, that we have given up our faithfulness to our husband. So you see, when Christians flirt with the world and engage in worldly things and become intimate with the world, then adultery is termed here is something that we've committed. Now adultery, we know physically, is when one mate uh, becomes intimate with someone who is not their mate. But here according to James, this is what happens to us spiritually if we become intimate with the world. I think we can understand this. We can see it with the world, I mean the physical. So let's try to envision it with the spiritual. It is the same with Christ. Because you see, we become married to uh, Christ. He's our uh, bridegroom. And we commit ourselves to Him, which is connecting to Him like a wife does to a husband. Galatians 3.27 says, we are baptized into Christ, and then we, at that time, we put on Christ. So there's an interweaving of our relationship with Jesus at the time of baptism, just like when a husband-to-be and a wife-to-be married. Yeah. So we at that point become a part of the bride of Christ. And we are taught and challenged to be faithful to him like a wife would be faithful to her husband. Good picture. Good teaching. <laughs> it helps us to know the specifics for sure. But if we're not faithful and we become friendly with the world, then we become adulterers and adulteresses. <clears throat> Which tells me that there is a picture here that's showing how that we can once be a Christian committed to our husband and then we can leave because this says you are now an adulterer or adulteress which means you have left your husband. Now 
in 1 John, it kind of paints a, a, a same type of picture. 1 John 2, verse 15, it says, Love not the world. Now, you know, this is a real challenge for us. We're in the flesh, and everyone around us is living the same. And the whole world around us is the world that you can't escape from. And there's no way that we can. But while we're here, our faithful husband calls upon us to be faithful to him. And, and just like in the physical world, uh, the husband, the wife, there's other people around that can be very attractive and very flirtatious and, and subtle and inviting. But once we take the marriage vow and have committed to a one husband wife and a one wife husband then all the rest it's all over with as far as walking with God is concerned this is meant to be same way is true of the Christian in their relationship with Jesus we're married to him and so it says love not the world even though we have to be in the world just like we are around other people who could draw us away from our mate, yes, we're in the world, but we're not to fall in love with that world. Pure and simple. Neither, neither the things that are in the world. And you know there's things dancing around us all the time that are attractive and alluring in the world. You know that as well as I. But if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You can't love them both. You don't have that capacity. You don't want that capacity. And verse 16 says, For all that is in the world, and here you go, is the desires of or lust of the flesh. We have fleshly lusts. Normally considered to be the sex angle. But it's far more than that. People fall in love with uh, other things. Uh, the drink habit. The womanizing habit. The drug habit and uh, the tobacco habit. Maybe you could even say the lying habit, the gossip habit. Yeah. All those kind of things that are of the world that are fleshly, of the flesh. And then there's the lust of the eyes. What got Eve in trouble? She should have had cataracts at a young age. <laughs> bifocals that didn't work. But it didn't happen that way. There's a lot of things that look so enticing. You know, when you get older, there's certain foods that you better not eat. But they dress that stuff all up so nice and you walk by and look at that and think, oh my. Yeah. When we went to this funeral yesterday, <coughs> they had a whole array and I picked out a little bit of potato salad and a little bit of bean salad. And one of the ladies said, Dick, do you want some of these sandwiches? I said, no. Well, all that bread and what have you does something to you. You know that, don't you? <laughs> yeah, it does something for you. Most of the time I don't even eat it new. So, the lust of the eye. Oh, how they can dress up the food. And the other things. And what's the other? The pride of life. How many 
How many youngsters, hey, the news just came out this week that more youngsters are beginning to smoke than ever before. Yep. All these uh, odds and ends that they invent so that yeah. they say uh, it doesn't hurt you. Well, that's, uh, that's an attraction, the pride. Uh, you got to do it in order to be up hipped with the people around you. Well, pride of life. Uh, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, it's too bad, really. God stuck us down here in the middle of a, of a rain barrel, all surrounded with all this uh, garbage. We have to resist it. Okay, we'll do it, Lord, because you said so. But verse 17 adds, And the world passes away and all the desires thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now everything that's an attraction out there in the world, a uh, fleshly attraction that can do you damage, that, that's all going to pass away. Now some of it may last forever and ever as far as existing, but... Uh, your old body's going to get old, and your old body's going to say, "Boy, it's sure easy, sure easy to resist that now." That's true. Yeah. So we're to love not the world. If we do, it is enmity with God, and we become adulterers and adulteresses. Now that doesn't sound very nice. Hostility with God. What does that mean? Well, just read your Bible a little bit. Pharaoh was hostile to God. Look what happened to him. He and his army were hostile to God. Look what happened to the whole army. Bottom of the Red Sea. In the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira, they said they sold their property for so much, but they lied about it, and in a short time they were in the cemetery doesn't pay to sneak on God and uh, be hostile to God. Uh, some people try and it looks like they get by with it, but it doesn't work. Eventually it catches up. Eventually. So don't try to be hostile. I remember going through a stage of life and I said, it doesn't pay to resist God. I, I just am going to give in and not resist Him in any way that I know of. You can't fight God. What good does it do to be hostile to God? Listen to this. Between an airplane and every other form of locomotion and transportation, there's only one difference. The horse and wagon, the automobile, the bicycle, the locomotive, speedboat, battleship. They all can come to a standstill without danger. And they can go in reverse and they're okay. But there is no reverse about the engine of an airplane. <laughs> it cannot back up. It dare not stand still. If it loses its momentum and forward drive, then it crashes. The only safety for the airplane is to keep going forward. And the same thing is true with the Christian. If you stop, hesitate, whatever, you're going to crash. And isn't that true? Amen. Yep. So... You become an enemy of God, and that means crash, landing. Then there's this last quick thought. Whoever is a friend of the world is an absolute enemy of God. And that doesn't sound good. In the Sermon on the Mount, 
In Matthew 6, verse 24, it says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or materialism. One or the other. This certainly infers that and teaches us that we better not be an enemy of God. I don't want to be. And of course this is quite a serious declaration. So we don't let worldly interests become our interests because we become an enemy of God. Friendships of the world do not attract us. We know better. Friendships with Christians and friendship with church, friendship with the Bible, friendship with the right things, amusements, pleasures, these do not attract us because we are attracted to our, our, our Jesus. Else we become an enemy of God. You know that's pretty serious. Yes. If any one of we men stepped into the ring with uh, Joe Lewis or all those other fighters of the past, we would get clobbered. Don't step in the ring with God. Now I don't like this what I'm going to read to you, but it sure illustrates the point. Some years ago, the most married man in the world was found in Yugoslavia. It happened this way. A young woman confided in her girl cousin of her impending marriage to a man. The bridegroom was so shy and timid that he wanted to keep the marriage secret. The cousin got curious. She got a good glimpse of the bridegroom after the secret wedding and recognized him as her husband. He had also married her secretly, claiming he was so shy and timid. That was only the beginning. A total of 50 women came forward and claimed that he had individually married them. In each case, he was the same bashful bridegroom. He was a traveling salesman. He would go from wife to wife by plane, supporting all 50 of them. And he gave this exclamation with each one that uh, he was a traveling salesman and had to keep on the go because of that. So they put him in jail and listen, he begged to stay there because he would rather be there now that all 50 of these wives knew what he had done. Probably the safest place for him. Now, you just think of that. Uh, the drug habits and the sin habits and the things that people do that are in the world add up after a while and they are just about like this man who had 50 wives and he should have known better. And a lot of times we should know better too. So you see James... Four, verse 4 says don't be a friend of the world or it's enmity with God or be an enemy with God and uh, that's adultery adulteress or adulterer and that doesn't sound very good and anyway let's read more of the Proverbs and see if Proverbs can't keep us on the right course what do you think? Yeah. 
Love not the world. 